This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Let's take a page from the It's Not How You Fall, It's How You Get Up file with Gary Slavin from Long Island. Financial advisor most of the week, writer the rest of the week. It took him six months to write his book, two years to get it published after a strange sighting gave him a story idea and a great title, Four Pebbles on a Beach. Uh, I was jogging in John Burns Park and uh, one day I witnessed a woman getting out of the car just like the book starts. And she was dressed to the nines. She bent over, pick up four pebbles and put them on a bench. And I thought that was odd. But this is Long Island. And a couple of days later, uh, another woman did the exact same thing. She parked in the exact same parking spot, put the pebbles on the bench. And I went to a friend of mine who's a retired cop. And I said, this is what I witnessed. And he starts laughing. And he says, Gary, he just witnessed a drug drop. What? <laughs> yes. So from that experience... The book came and uh, it's the twist and turns of life. You know, uh, what what would happen if someone got involved with the drug guys and um, where would they go from there? So I think the book is really about as Americans, we're not always given the best choices in life. We're given choices. We may not like them, but take the best one and run with it and try your best to do your best. And that's what happens with Warren and Marianne in the book, because they're both vets. They both kind of got the raw, raw, raw end of the stick. And it's how they make a life out of it. And they succeed at it. What happens is Mary Ann, she's a homeless vet who, uh, because of a Pentagon foul up, they can't find her papers. So she's not eligible for any benefits. So she goes through pails every morning trying to pick out the bottles to return and get the nickel. And one morning she goes to this pail and there's a, an envelope full of money and she takes it. That money belongs to the drug kingpin, Warren, and he wants his money back. And so she, he gives her a choice, either give me my money back or come work for me and work it off. Oh. She doesn't have any money. So she gets into the drug business. And so she becomes a runner and eventually becomes a partner and she takes over the business. and. At all times, there are different drug gangs trying to get the same customers or the same territories. And so the two of them go through that, you know, different rings, different cartels are trying to take their territory. And eventually the Chinese try to come in and take the territory. And then there's a big fight over it. You know, it sounds like you did a lot of research to figure out how this all works. Like your friend, the cop, help you out with that? He helped me out with what would happen if someone found the money. And he said to me, she's a civilian. She's not going to get killed, but she's going to get roughed up, roughed up a lot. So um, instead of roughing her up, I, I, ba- I basically said, OK, listen, you're coming to work for me to pay this off because you obviously don't have any money. I mean, she had a choice to make, but she really didn't. No, no. And, and that's why I think it's truly an American story, because a lot of times we don't have those choices. You have to survive. You have to survive. And, and especially after the pandemic, I'm thinking like, People have to survive and you know, no one knows what they have to do to survive, but they're going to survive. And one of the phrases in the book from Marianne, she goes, I'm going to survive this. I'm not going to die. So it sounds like you had a really good time writing this. I did. I did. But the, the best thing was when the book came to my house, you know, it's published, it's bound. And uh, my wife read the whole manuscript and things like that. But it was when the book came to the house and I took it out of the box and I showed it to my wife. Uh, my wife, there's a big smile on her face. And she knows now my husband, the author, made it. You know what I mean? That that made it. So it was it was nice. It was really nice. But um So now what in the worst possible time to promote a book? <laughs> yeah, you, you can't go to Barnes and Noble and do a book signing. So I'm doing it all on social media. Uh I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, I have a website, GarySlavenAuthor.com, all one word. And uh, the, the website has an email if you want more information. It is, there is more information about the book there. And I'm getting, some, uh, I'm getting a good reviews. Uh, a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, the online book club gave it four out of four stars. During Christmas, I took photographs of the book on the benches at John Burns Park. And I put it on Facebook and said, where is this? I thought about doing that and going because there's two diners in the book. It's the Maspico Diner and the Nautilus Diner. 
So I was going to go to their two places and ask the owners if I could just take a picture of my book here because you're in the book and then ask them, hey, you know, you know where this place is. It's in the book, you know. Right. They could put that on their counter. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Gary, I'm looking forward to that sequel. Thank you. Let's go out to Diamond D Movie Ranch, a field full of movie sets where more films than you can count have been shot over decades. Rene Valuze tells the story of how he got where he is today in his book entitled My High Adventures Behind the Movie Scenes, a story that begins when you were in the movies, right? Well, my dad, he started with a cattle ranch. And when I was young, I was on the show Wagon Train. And what had happened was, is the director had said, can we go out and film on your location? So I'd asked my dad at the time, and he didn't believe that anybody would want to pay money to take pictures of a cow. But I had to convince him. The show came out and they filmed. And we had such a good experience with them. The director said to us, hey, if you build a few more sets, you could uh, get us to come out here more often. It's called the locations business. We started building outdoor standing sets on our cattle ranch, and we started with a simple Mexican town, and we did all kinds of shows back in the 80s. MacGyver, Dukes of Hazzard, the A-Team. So you've been around since the 80s. That's correct. And we started with our original location, which was called the Veluze Movie Ranch. Veluze, what a great name. Not a lot of people really understand the movie business. And um, I have had so many experiences that I just needed to get out. I, I have met a lot of stars. One of them was Tom Cruise. And um, I was actually very nervous to meet him. I thought he was a megastar. He was going to come in in a helicopter, land on the ground, do a little scout of the location for a PSA that they were doing. Well, I got everything all prepared. I drive a water truck, a 4,000-gallon water truck. I got the pad all wet down so when the helicopter came in, there would be no dust. And um, my goal that day is, you know, I always wanted to have a picture of me with Tom Cruise. At the end of the scout, I was kind of nervous. So I went up and I said to Tom, I said, Tom, what do you think of my location? He says, it's absolutely wonderful. It's going to be great. We're going to love it. I said, hey, Tom, would you mind if I got a picture with you? Well, he came up, he got right in my face and he says, Renee, I don't think so. Unless your son will take the picture. Come right up here, buddy. He puts his arm around me. He was just joking. He had me there and he just was the nicest person. Over the years, I have met everybody. We had uh, the show American Sniper with Bradley Cooper out there. Joe Rogan doing his Fear Factor show at my uh, other location. All kinds of famous people. Uh, Anna Nicole Smith out for the show, um, Skyscraper. You know, you're working with people who are very smart, who have a lot of money invested, and everything needs to be done on a schedule. So a lot of times they'll give you a scene that they want to do. Maybe they're blowing up a gas station. Maybe they're setting off some giant explosion to simulate a war scene. And everything needs to go absolutely perfect for the director. So it's my job to make sure everything is coordinated on our location to make sure that that scene is absolutely perfect. I have a bunch of locations. I started out at the Veluze Movie Ranch. I was doing that with my brothers in Santa Clarita. It's within what's called the 30 mile zone. You see, everybody that films in California, when you go outside what's known as the 30 mile zone, you have to pay per diem. So everybody within the 30 mile zone, they don't have to do that. We are considered a bona fide movie studio. You know, I have a website, it's veluze.com. It's got pictures of my current location on it. What we did was we started out at the old location. It was known as the Veluze Movie Ranch. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to start my own location separate from my brothers. So what I did right around the time 2000, I went out and I bought my own 100-acre movie ranch that we named Blue Cloud Movie Ranch. And we were actually the number one working movie ranch in 2001. We had pulled even more permits than Disney Ranch itself. Wow. Mostly what we do is for filming. So we'll have location scouts come out and visit. It's not open to the public like a Warner Brothers studio or whatnot. But we have been known to do tours for um, special guests. Cool. Renee, it sounds very exciting. Good for you. Oh, thank you so much. A lot of people don't understand this business, and I'm just doing my best in my book to explain to everybody what an honor it is to be working with these people in this industry. Well, your enthusiasm comes right through the cell phone, Renee. Thank you.
Joyce Figert was inspired by writers of the Purple Sage to start writing in high school, but it wasn't until about 2000 that she took an advanced writing course on children's literature, and she was promised she'd have a book fit to be published by the time she was done. Well, here it is. Secret Agenda. Actually, the fictional book is based on true facts because in 1970, I bought a house in St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, our neighbor had a lot of animals. And every night, her car would start up at 10 o'clock, and in the morning, it'd be full of cats and dogs. They smelled bad, and the dogs barked all night. And the neighbors did take up the petition, and she sold her home and moved to the country. And later that summer, I read where the SPCA lady had climbed this fence and found a trailer full of dogs and cats in deplorable conditions. And it said also that she was charged with cruelty to animals, and she was selling them for medical research. So the book is really based on facts. Oh, my goodness. Yes, that's where I got the plot. So in your book, who is this woman? She's a nasty neighbor, Mrs. Casbury. She's really a villain. Okay, and Neil lives next door and his dog went missing? Well, he's visiting his cousin because his mother is preparing for the new baby to be born. And he stays two weeks with his cousin, Jonathan. And Jonathan, it's Jonathan's neighbor. And uh, they find these cats and dogs every morning and they want to uh, find out the mystery of where they came from and what she's doing with them. Does she get what's coming to her in this book? Yes, she does. <laughs> These boys are amazing. Are the boys based on children you know? No, they're fictional. I never had any children my own, but a lot of it's uh, based on things I did when I grew up going to the fair and uh, saving my money all year and things of that. It tells the world before the computers and the all the electronics that kids have today, how we lived. So would you recommend people who want to write to take a course like the one you took? Absolutely, yes. They critiqued every month, and I sent my assignments in and taught me how to write in the first person and not to ramble and to make my words count. But I think the the poetic way I described the kids floating on the creek about the frogs jumping and they see minnows and how the sun reflected on the mirror of the truck made prisons of color, things like that. I learned from Zane Gray's Riders of the Purple Sage. (laughs) From so long ago, it still influenced you. Yes, yes. That one book my sister left behind and I found it in the attic. So you never had kids of your own. Are you able to find kids? You, you, you said that this is a book for middle schoolers. Yes, I have a lot of nieces and nephews, and I've been like a second mom to them and uh, really enjoy children. But uh, I did give my little neighbor a book for his birthday, and he enjoyed it. And my grandson says, Grammy Joyce wrote a book, and he's so excited. <laughs> you should get all of your nieces and nephews to put it out on their social media that you wrote this book. There you go. Well, I am on Facebook. I've had a lot of congratulations. I belong to three authors groups on uh, Facebook. And I had a call from California saying they wanted to promote my book, of course, for a fee. But she said that I was highly recommended by the Library of Congress. She wanted to be in the book review for the New York Times. I haven't really done much with that yet, but... She wants you to pay for that? Yes. For a book review in the New York Times? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, once your name is out there as a first-time author, unscrupulous people do tend to pop up. So, uh, yeah, you got to be careful. All right, Joyce, we're going to take a quick break. We're coming right back. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Attention all authors. Page Publishing is looking for authors. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, Apple iTunes, and other outlets. They handle all aspects of the publishing process for you. Printing, cover art, publicity, copyright, and editing. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. 
That's 800-204-6099 for your free author submission kit. We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. A freshman at Penn State University, Caroline Quate was encouraged by her fifth grade teacher to seriously consider writing. One of many story ideas she wrote then, she finished when she was in high school with the encouragement of her mom. And now she's published Secret Land of Creatures. Basically, it's about this girl who um, one day with her dog, she falls underground and discovers this world that's a never-lasting winter storm. So it's always snowing 24-7. And she finds this family that lives there, and they kind of explain to her like how they got there, why it's always snowing, and how they got there and the predicament that they're in. Since she's the only person that's found them in so long, they ask her if she can help them escape from this world that she's discovered because they're basically trapped under the ruling of a queen that doesn't like them. So then she goes on to help them and finds out quite a lot of things. She makes new friendships. She fights monsters, which is how she helps the family kind of escape. They're kind of like the queen's like little minions that they have to fight to escape from this everlasting winter land. And she gets uh, superpowers? Yes, she does. She gets superpowers. Oh, gosh, you're giving away my whole book. Well, not really, because we don't know how or what happens. Oh, true. Is this a book for anybody? Is it a book for kids? I would say it's mainly targeted toward, like, children. But honestly, teenagers could read it, too. Anybody could read it. I believe the main target audience, like the main audience that would really appreciate it and like enjoy reading it are like elementary school children, fourth grade, fifth grade. Um, I post it on my social media, like my Instagram, my Snapchat. Um, I tell my friends about it. My sister, I tell my sister because she's in fourth grade. I tell my sister to tell her friends about it. Um, to tell their parents so they can possibly buy it for them. Um, I told my cousins about it because I have a lot of cousins that are kind of in like elementary school and stuff. There you go. Yeah, so I kind of just tell everybody. I tell my friends, like word of mouth, internet. I just kind of, you know, let everybody know, hey, I wrote a book. You should go check it out. Is that working out for you? Slow but steady. Slow but steady. Um, I can only do so much, you know. I can only say so much. I can only tell people, hey, go check out my book. But it's really up to people if they really go do check it out and buy it and read it. So hopefully, you know, as time goes on, the pace picks up. And I'm also trying to get it um, in stores, in a Barnes & Noble store or like... um, in bookstores and stuff like that. So hopefully once I do that, you know, it will also pick up, like the sales will pick up as well. All right, Caroline, you know, I'm glad to hear that you can fall back on your uh, pre-med studies there at Penn State University. Good luck. You got a lot going on. Richard Blum writes about everything in Las Vegas, but the book he published was inspired by a radio interview he heard with John Lennon. The name of his book is Grayson Knowles, A Dystopian Solution. I was listening to an interview on the Beatles channel, and he said that he and the boys were getting ready to go on stage, and the band before him was playing their exact set in the exact order they were going to play it in. He says, man, we better start writing some music be original, get our own stuff. And then, of course, the rest is history. But what he really said in that thing was, you don't know what you can do until you try. It got me off the couch. But then you start thinking about guys like uh, Rod Serling. Loved his short stories. Fabulous. This is a story of a dystopian future, if you will, where people have given up for the sake of argument, I might say, say, you know, thinking everything all the way through. And what happens when you leave things to other people? What's the result when there's a breakdown of social norms? That's one of the things that's written on the back. And if you say, well, fix it for me, just fix it for me. I'm tired of seeing this. Fix it for me. This book is about what happens when we fix it for you. 
and it goes into some really neat territory. It has, well, just to say, if you got tired of the homeless people in the street, he didn't want them anymore. And you got tired of the prisoners getting out of jail and you wanted them back in, but you really didn't want them anymore. And you wanted to just live this wonderful life under the stars. Everybody's just going along wonderful. But there's a reason that you were able to go along wonderful. All that other stuff did go away, but somebody made it go away. How did they make it go away? And that's basically the basis for the book. It's quite dystopian, but it's also a solution. His name is Ben. He's a ex-soldier, gifted prisoner, if you will. And does he try to fight back? Yes. But the new system, if you will, is somewhat computer-driven. And AI has a very unique way of controlling human beings in ways that, you know, they're not going to crush your kneecaps or anything. They just have another unique way of doing it, which is in the book. And he gets to the end where he just isn't believing in anything. And can he win or can't he win is pretty much the way the thing is. But along the way, it also brings up issues that you could point towards morality of people past, present, and future. Where are we going? Are we paying attention to what we're voting for? I don't know. You should. But if you don't, you might, after reading this, oh, well, I better start paying attention when they say, what do you think of this? Yeah, I get an opinion. So that's part of the things it points out. And by the time Ben gets an opinion, <laughs> things just are already happening. And that is a cool thing to the book. I've already written the next one uh, that goes past this, and it's where you actually get to talk to the computer itself. And it just, when I write sometimes, I scare myself because I go, oh, no, that wouldn't be like, oh, my gosh, could I really do that? <laughs> and the stories just develop. I guess for me personally, what did I do? I'm a, I'm a disabled person now, 100%. I crashed one too many helicopters, and it didn't work out for me. So I'm 100% disabled soldier. So it leaves you typing and thinking. They can always use your brain. A brain is an amazing thing. I have a friend who uh, has um, uh, 800,000 followers. And she wants to put me on her Instagram page and use this book as a way in. But I have to have the second one, which I just got registered with the Library of Congress. Have not gone through the actual process of, of um, um, you know, printing it into book form. But I'd like to have at least two of them on the way. And by the way, I'm writing the third one, which is what happens when these two guys get together. The, the computer that was there, now the AI, you got to ask it questions. And now what's it really going to do? Oh, my goodness. It's a rod sewing this type of thing. All right, Richard, keep him busy there. Thank you. Henry Nicole is a retired home health aide in Colorado where he helped mostly elderly people. So it's no surprise a man with that kind of compassion writes poetry. He started writing when he was a young boy in Guatemala. And by sixth grade, he was one of a group of poets who won an international poetry contest. Now he's published his first book entitled Omnipresent Love. I came to the United States. I became later an American citizen. And so I was a part of the International Library of Poetry. But this is the first book I ever published, written by my, or not shared with other, other authors. God is the omnipresent love. And so uh, I share this, this poetry about love because it, it goes into all kinds of aspects of, uh, of life, like uh, the homeless, so the people that are with drugs or help stop you know, unnecessary wars. And the uh, omnipresent love poem says that it says this. This is the one I started, the one that got an international prize, but it's in Spanish, so I translate into English. Can I read it? Please. Okay. Prisoners of time and space we are, if in obscure cells of mortal illusions, living a destiny traveling through clouds, buried by sadness and listening cries. Bells keep now ringing. The dead are now resting, but the dreams of a child are sweet remembrances. Damned soul of dawn in the far corners of time, blessed rose in the heart so sad. Humans pray hosts which fragrant they are, which fragrant they are, and wake up in glorious eternal destiny. All is infinite life in your very same presence resurrects you the dead and springs up existence. 
you God of the heavens, fortress of my soul, forever all conscious, you protect me with love. That was beautiful. Uh, I also wrote a poem that has a lot to do with uh, the indigenous people, or you can say the Mayans, or you can say the American Indians, you know. And this is a, a poem that brings uh, this idea that of war is, is not the solution for anything. And it says, this is the Indian princess. The thunders were roaring, invaders reported. The gods were in anger. Our warriors were killed. What hope for our children? What place for subsistence if freedom is murdered by pale gods with guns? The chief took them counsel with elders in witchcraft and gave them the order of killing the princess, that beautiful princess whose sides were as opals, who served to bring peace with her innocent blood. The time was now closing the real with the unreal, the wide gap of questions and cycles of life. Unfortunate princess, was it necessary to bring to an end the bliss of her heart? The strings were reflecting a beautiful figure. Her hair was so pristine that glowed in the dark. The princess was bathing, perfuming with flowers. Eternal in fragrance, just like her own life. Could this be the answer for all her inquiries? Could this be the mission for her in her life? For seeds become flowers, and fragrance continues, and she's pure fragrance of innocent beauty. She questions the existence of devilish deities. For men destroy nature, and nature is from God. Are all these invaders just men like our own men, with criminal weapons and lust in their hearts? My God is immortal. He brings all this beauty. He's not just one God with criminal mind. Let them destroy flowers like me in this river. I'll fly to the heavens and be then a star. The princess kept talking. The river was crying. Her pets were comforting these last days of spring. It's beautiful. You read beautifully. Uh, I do have a website. It's omnipresentlovepoetry.com and then slash bye. Nice job, Henry. Thanks so much. Thanks to all of our authors. And that's all the time we have. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. If you missed anything, just go to 710wor.com and download the podcast. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. Catch you next time.